tested positive. Sadly, 9,875 people have now died, an increase of 917 on yesterday. As this virus continues to devastate families across our nation, my thoughts, prayers, and heartfelt condolences are with their friends, their families, and their loved ones. To everybody suffering from this horrific virus, whether you are at home or receiving care from our brilliant NHS in hospital, you are in all our thoughts at this devastating time. And I'm very pleased to say that the Prime Minister continues to make good progress. But these stark figures highlight the gravity of this national emergency. The devastating impact of this virus and the unprecedented but necessary action that we are taking to tackle it is affecting every aspect of our daily lives. This virus is also changing the nature of the threat that we face from crime. Martin and myself today will update you on the emerging crime picture and the extra work that the government, along with law enforcement partners, is undertaking to better protect victims. And Martin will set out that total crime has dropped as people follow the necessary advice to stay at home. But while the guidelines are helping to keep the majority of us safe, they also amplify danger for others, leaving people feeling vulnerable, isolated and exposed because criminal, criminality also continues to adapt. Fraudsters are exploiting coronavirus as a hook for new acquisitive crimes, with losses to victims already exceeding £1.8 million. And the perpetrators of sickening online child abuse are seeking to exploit the fact that more and more young people and children are at home and are online. And in the last week, the National Domestic Abuse Helpline reported a 120% increase in the number of calls it received in one 24-hour period. Now, while we have not yet seen a sustained rise in reports of domestic abuse to the police, this increase in those seeking help for this hidden crime is extremely concerning. And being no doubt, there'll be absolutely no let-up in our operational response. For the victims of these crimes, home is not the safe haven that it should be. And that is why I have been working with law enforcement, charities, schools, businesses, and local councils to address this changing threat picture. Our incredible police officers and firefighters are out in their communities right now, yes, helping to fight crime, but also to protect the vulnerable and to protect victims. And I want to emphasize that anybody who is a victim of these crimes can still get help. Anyone in immediate danger should call 999 and press 55 on a mobile if they are unable to talk. Let me repeat that again. Anyone in immediate danger should call 999 and press 55 on a mobile if you are unable to talk. Our outstanding police will absolutely be there for you. The National Crime Agency is also bearing down on offenders and raising awareness to protect victims of fraud, cybercrime and child abuse. But we all must do more to protect our neighbours, our friends, our family members by sharing information about the support that is available. The Chancellor this week announced a £750 million package. It was a boost for charities, including those charities providing services for victims of domestic abuse and their families. And today I can announce that we will go even further to provide support for those in danger of domestic abuse. And I'm launching a new national communications campaign to reach out to those who are at risk from abuse, highlighting that they can still leave home to get the support that you need. It will signpost victims in terms of how they can access help, but also to reassure them by making sure that they can access the services that they need at this particular time. And importantly, it will tell them that they are not alone. Coronavirus has opened Britain's enormous heart and shown our love and compassion for one another as we come together to help those who are most in need. And I'm now asking this nation to use that amazing compassion and community spirit to embrace those who are trapped 
in the horrific cycle of abuse. To help us all look out for those who need help, we have created a new campaign, and we have created a symbol of hope, a handprint embossed with a heart, so that people can easily show that we will not tolerate abuse as a society. I ask you, and I urge everyone to share this on social media or in the windows of your own homes, just to demonstrate how much we care and how much our country cares. And also, we can show and take the time out to show the victims of domestic abuse that they are not on their own. I'm also providing up to two million pounds to enhance online support services and the helplines for domestic abuse so that anybody who needs that help and support can access that support. These services will be boosted from new IT provided by the business, the company Fujitsu, to assist smaller domestic abuse charities and their trained support workers to provide the crucial services remotely. We all know that there are concerns about capacity right now in the system, and in particular for refugees, to provide enough spaces, accommodation during these challenging times. Now, I'm clear about this. It's the perpetrators who should be the ones that have to leave the family homes, and not the supposed loved ones whom they torment and abuse. Our priority is to get the abusers out, but sadly, this is not always possible. So where a victim and their children do need to leave, we will ensure that they have a safe place to go to. And that's why we are looking at alternative accommodation to support those in need at this difficult time. Fighting coronavirus requires an extraordinary national effort. And I would like to reiterate my personal thanks to everybody across all aspects of society and our country for playing their part. I'm immensely grateful to everyone who is heeding the instruction to stay at home. This remains crucial over the bank holiday weekend, especially as the weather continues to improve. But we have given the police powers to enforce the necessary measures we have put in place, including through the enforcement of fines. And I'd like to thank them, our police officers and the staff, who are working tirelessly to keep us safe, for engaging with the public so constructively to encourage everyone to do the right thing and avoid the need to use those powers. The overwhelming majority of the people are listening and making their own sacrifices to support our amazing police officers and staff as they protect and safeguard the most vulnerable. But my message to anyone still refusing to do the right thing is clear. If you don't pay your part, our selfless police, who are out there risking their own lives to save others, will be unafraid to act. Their work is helping our doctors, our nurses, our health professionals, to fight this virus and to save lives. If you don't follow the guidance, you will be endangering the lives of your own friends, family and loved ones. To protect those that you care about and the capacity of our police and our hospitals to protect us all, there is just one simple thing we ask you all to do. That is to stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. I'll now hand over to Martin for an operational update. Thank you, Home Secretary. In many ways, this feels a very different Easter weekend for all of us, not travelling to see family and friends or out enjoying the glorious weather. It feels different for the police officers and staff who are working this weekend too. They have new responsibilities. They are tackling new risks. The streets are empty, businesses are closed as we all adapt to a new way of life. But much does remain the same. Officers are still out in their communities fighting crime, protecting victims, and tackling antisocial behaviour. Some example in recent days, a man arrested in the Isle of Wight in connection with a £10 million importation of cocaine. Seven people arrested in London, including two at Heathrow Airport who were attempting to flee the country as part of an ongoing investigation into serious violent crime. 400 domestic abuse suspects arrested in two weeks in the West Midlands. And as criminals seek to take advantage of the virus, a man has been jailed for stealing personal protective equipment from a hospital here in the capital. And the less visible policing continues too. The work to trace child abusers, to track terrorists, and to protect us from cyber attacks goes on as before. And we're taking preventive action as well. 
the National Crime Agency are now taking down fraudulent websites and email addresses and have launched an online safety at home campaign, giving parents information to keep their children safe while they're likely to be spending more time on their devices. Initial figures from all forces show a 21% fall in overall crime across the last four weeks compared to the same period last year. That drop, combined with the commitment of our over 200,000 officers and staff across the UK, and the fantastic response from our volunteer special constables, who worked more than 222,000 hours in March, means that we are in a strong position. Keep reporting crime to us. Our teams are working round the clock to keep you safe and respond to emergencies. I particularly want to reinforce the Home Secretary's message to victims of domestic abuse or controlling behaviour. We will come when you call for help. And to abusers, do not think that this is a time where you can get away with this. We will still arrest, we will still bring people into custody, and we will still prosecute. Fighting the virus and protecting the NHS and saving lives is a national effort. And police have stepped up in their work alongside communities to support those hardest hit by the virus and to reduce the strain on the NHS and other care services. For example, two officers in London responded to a call where a 90-year-old woman had collapsed in her home. They gave first aid and recommended that she should go to hospital. But she was concerned because she didn't think she'd get to the shop in time to get milk. So the officers were able to get that milk for her and even helped her fix, the bro fix a broken light bulb when she got back. Two other officers in Manchester responded to a concern for welfare call and encountered an elderly man who had no electricity, heating or food. The neighbourhood policing team, working with the local housing department and businesses, were able to put money on his meter and get his fridge fully stocked for the next day. And he now has a community contact in case he needs any further support. And officers in Cambridgeshire have been linking with a citizenship group to deliver tablet devices to vulnerable school children to ensure that they too can continue to learn at home while the schools are closed. And of course we have new responsibilities given to us as part of the government response to the virus, which we will use carefully. In the UK, police gain their legitimacy and authority from the consent and support of our communities and the public. We are implementing the new regulations in that tradition of British policing. Since the new powers were introduced, officers have engaged with thousands of people, and in most cases, these people have quickly understood why it's important to follow the rules, and no enforcement has been necessary. Officers on the ground are telling me that they're seeing a great amount of support from the public, and indeed getting thanks for the role that they are playing. However, we have had a small minority of people who, despite our best efforts, have refused to follow the instruction and officers have needed to use their enforcement powers. Next week, we will publish full data on enforcement so far, which will include this Easter weekend. But I can tell you now that using early data from 37 forces, that 1,084 fines have been issued in England and Wales up to Thursday the 8th of April. So across all of those forces, that's an average of less than 84 a day. This shows that the overwhelming majority of people are abiding by the rules and are staying at home to protect the NHS and to save lives. And I think it also shows that our approach, engage, explain and encourage, and only as the last resort to enforce, is working. In those few cases where officers or police forces have made mistakes in interpreting the new regulations, they have quickly sought to correct them and provide the necessary clarity. We will continue to be guided by principles of fairness, proportionality and common sense. And I recognise that it's important that the public are able to judge us on whether we are keeping to those principles. So we will publish enforcement data every fortnight as we move through this crisis. This remains a very challenging situation for everybody, public and the police, as we all adapt to the changes that the country has seen. Thank you to all those officers and staff that are working this weekend and throughout these testing times. On top of the work that you do every day to keep your communities safe, you're now also helping doctors, nurses and other healthcare workers 
to fight this virus and save lives. Police chiefs will continue to work with government, with staff associations and others to give you the guidance, the protective equipment and testing so that you can do your job as safely as possible. Thank you again to the public for your continued support. And my plea to you is simple, even in times of frustration and this good weather, work with us, stay home, protect the NHS and save lives. Thank you, Martin. I'll now hand over to Professor Powers. Well, as we've heard, the uh, instructions that we have all been given uh, to stay at home, to avoid social contact, to maintain social distancing, are all designed to ensure that we stop the spread of this virus, we reduce the number uh, of cases and we save lives uh, and reduce pressure on the NHS. And although I know uh, that there is a lot of anger at the foolish few who think they can flout the rules, uh, I would like, like to pay tribute to the vast majority, as you've heard from Martin, the vast majority of the British public who are clearly uh, complying uh, with the instructions that have been given. And we see that in many ways. Uh, as the first uh, chart shows, we continue to see uh, that the use of public transport uh, has been very, very great, greatly reduced, and that is being maintained uh, over the weeks uh, of the lockdown. In the next chart, you will see that that is uh, then translating uh, from a, a stabilization in the number of infections through to what you see, uh, through uh, to the number of new cases. So, uh, as we see here, uh, there has been a leveling off of the number of new cases. It does vary from day to day, but by and large, uh, this is the sort of effect that we would expect to see uh, from everybody following those instructions. And then in the next um, slide, uh, you can see that that in turn is translating into a stabilization, first uh, signs of a plateauing uh, of uh, people who unfortunately need to be uh, hospitalized or in hospital uh, beds. You can see, uh, as we said before, that there are more cases in London because uh, spread in London uh, has come first, uh, but early signs of stabilization uh, in the rest of the country too. Uh, and then uh, in the next uh, chart, uh, unfortunately, as I and others have said before, uh, we are still seeing uh, sadly high uh, numbers of deaths. Uh, that will be the very final thing that will change and start to decrease. Uh, but we are confident that if everybody applies, uh, the, the, follows the instructions, complies and follows the instructions that uh, we've all been given, then that will begin to translate in the next uh, weeks into a reduction. Uh, in, uh, in, in the daily deaths. Um, now, the NHS strategy through all of this has been uh, to ensure that we always have the capacity uh, to deal with the surge in numbers of patients with coronavirus. And that has been the case, and my colleagues in the NHS are working night and day around the clock to ensure that that headroom, that that capacity, whether it's for people who are intensive care units, who need ventilators, through to people on general wards, that that headroom is there. That also means that at the same time, the NHS is open for business for people who have other illnesses. Uh, this weekend, for example, it's a bank holiday weekend. General practices are open, pharmacies are open. So if you are unwell with a condition that is not uh, coronavirus, if you have symptoms of a heart attack that you're worried about or symptoms of a stroke, if you have a sick child who's deteriorating, if you're a pregnant woman and you're worried about the movements of your, your baby, then you should be accessing services in exactly the same way that you always have done, through 111, through GP uh, services, uh, or in emergencies through 999. The NHS is uh, open for business and managing and capable of managing uh, people with a wide range uh, of uh, illness. So, uh, as I said at the start, um, the entire strategy is to ensure that by following instructions, something that we must all follow, uh, we will see a reduction in deaths and we will protect the NHS. It is a bank holiday weekend. It's a time of year when typically we would be celebrating or getting together with relatives and close friends. But I'm afraid this year it has to be for all of us a stay at home Easter. Thank you, Professor Powers. Now, I think we're um, good to take our questions from 
journalists. Um, and the first question to David Shookman from the BBC. Good afternoon. David, we can't hear you. Are you sure you're not on mute? <laughs> Is that better? Can you hear me now? David, uh, thank you. Could you start thank again, you. please? Thank you. Good, good afternoon and apologies to everybody. A couple of questions, if I may, about personal protective equipment. Uh, one is a detailed one for Stephen Powers, if I may. We get some very big numbers for items of PPE being supplied, but it's very hard to compare them with items actually needed on the front line in hospitals. I mean, I'm thinking in particular of FFP3 face masks and gowns, which I gather are, are single use. Can you tell us how many are needed week by week and how many are actually being delivered. And then a question to the Home Secretary. Um, day after day, questions come up about shortages of PPP. I wonder whether on behalf of the government you'd be able to give a commitment to a date when what's needed on the front line is actually delivered. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Stephen. So on, on, PP, uh, on PPE, uh, as we have said many times and the Secretary of State uh, for Health and Social Care said yesterday, it's absolutely critical uh, that we get uh, PPE out uh, to uh, all those uh, working at the front line uh, so that they uh, not only are protected but they feel safe. And, and there are three elements to that. The first is uh, on the guidance uh, for PPE uh, and just over a week ago, uh, that guidance was updated. It was updated uh, by Public Health England, but in collaboration and with input from a wide number of professional groups, including the Royal College of Nursing, the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. So I'm very confident uh, that we have a set of guidance that every, every professional, all professionals, uh, can sign up to uh, and are confident that it's uh, based on the best scientific evidence that we have. Uh, the second strand is to ensure that the supply chain is working, and, uh, and this has been a huge uh, increase in the distribution, the number of organisations uh, that need to be supplied uh, with PPE. So we've been working, NHS England, with the government to make sure, uh, supporting the government to make sure that we get that supply through. It's very difficult to give you a precise number because it varies from day to day and it varies from organisation to organisation. But I can assure you that we are increasingly collecting that information as the supply chain is changed with the assistance of the military so that we do have that detailed information at organisational level. Uh, and at the same time, we are ensuring that we uh, have a, a good line of sight to the equipment that is available and that which will be coming in through the third strand, which is procuring equipment. Uh, clearly, there is a, uh, a global demand for uh, personal protective equipment at the moment, and I know that government, with our support, is working night and day to ensure that we procure the PPE uh, that we need. So, for instance, in uh, FFP3 masks that you mentioned, uh, I do have confidence that we have uh, supplies of FFP3 masks uh, that are required. Uh, and on gowns, we're working very hard as you speak. Uh, we extended the use of gowns in the guidance uh, last week, so uh, we knew there would be some short-term uh, uh, challenges to the supply chain, but we are working very hard, including with the Health and Safety Executive, uh, to ensure that we can use the widest range of gowns possible uh, to ensure uh, that that supply is there. Uh, and as I said, uh, we are procuring uh, from everywhere and including from the manufacturing base uh, in the UK, you heard Burberry and others are now manufacturing gowns in the UK to ensure that that supply uh, is secure. Stephen, thank you. And David, in answer to your question, um, Stephen's obviously covered off the main strategy and the plan that has been also outlined by the Secretary of State for Health yesterday here, where he spoke very clearly about the measures and the steps that are taking place around PPE. I think it's worth noting, certainly for viewers at home, is that absolutely the government is working across every single agency that they would expect us to work with, health and safety exec, Public Health England, um, various um, groups and organisations within the supply chain. We are also working to do exactly that in terms of procuring PPE for other aspects of public services too. So please fire, um, certainly something that Martin and I have been working on over the last four weeks, and ensuring that we have not just the distribution but the supply chain. And we already know that certainly from a police and fire perspective, and this links over to prisons and other key public services, we've abs 
absolutely secured our supply chain. Every single aspect of public service requires different guidance around PPE and also different types of guidance, and that's exactly what we've all been working through. Was there anything else you, you wanted to come back on? Well, just is, would it be possible to give a commitment to a date by when the right quantities will reach the right people? Because every day we hear from certainly NHS frontline staff that they don't have the equipment that they need. Sure. Well, I think, David, look, I mean, I can't speak for every single strand right now of public services and PPE, um, but the plan has been outlined, certainly by the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. But from a policing perspective, you know, we're already out there in terms of making sure that we have enough gloves, face masks, and a, and a substantial supply chain as well, with already 1.5 million gloves and masks in the pipeline for distribution. So th this is about various aspects of various services, whether it's policing, fire, prisons, the NHS. Of course, the NHS is the priority right now, which is why we're asking people to stay at home. But at the same time, as Stephen has outlined, and also the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, there is a clear plan. We're working with not just suppliers, but manufacturers to really bolster and boost the supply that we need for PPA, PPE, which quite frankly is unprecedented during this crisis. Can I move on to the next question, please, which is um, Igo Gilmore from <clears throat> Channel 4. Um, it's a question for the Home Secretary. Home Secretary, will you apologise to NHS staff and their families who've told us it's the lack of necessary PPE that's led to preventable mass infections and many deaths? Well, I think it's... I mean, look, absolutely, we are focused as a government across all departments to make sure that everyone in the NHS has everything they need in terms of resources and equipment. Um, and PP is at the heart of that. Obviously, it is absolutely the heart of protecting everybody who is working night and day right now to save lives, to save lives and prevent further deaths. Now, as you've already heard from Stephen, you've heard from the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, as well over a number of occasions and just standing here yesterday, that there is a clear plan when it comes to PPE in the NHS. There are there have been distribution issues. Those issues have now been addressed through working with the military, the MOD, who are absolutely triaging and getting the supplies out to the front line. But at the same time, there is an enormous effort, a Herculean effort right now, in terms of bolstering up our manufacturing capability and capacity. We've already heard Stephen refer to some big companies such as Rolls-Royce and also Burberry, who are up in their own production and stepping into this area. So our priority is absolutely to make sure that they are equipped, they are resourced and the front line of the NHS. And what I would say to you is that this government and all colleagues are committed to doing that and we are working day and night. We're bringing in new resources, new support staff, the MOD, other government departments, working with new businesses and other partners to make sure that not only can we get the supply out to people, but that we're also boosting our own supplies and demands in the United in our own supply in the UK. But, but no apology, Home Secretary, for well, these failings which NHF staff and their families blame on the government. Well, I'm sorry if people feel that there have been failings. I'll be very, very clear about that. But at the same time, we are in an un in an unprecedented global health pandemic right now. It is inevitable that the demand and the pressures on PPE and the demand for PPE are going to be exponential. They're going to be incredibly high. And of course, we are trying to address that as a government. And I think that is right. That is our priority. Matt Hancock, as Secretary of State for Health, has spoken about this repeatedly through the plan that he has outlined and obviously the ways in which we want to do much more to manufacture our own PPE in this country while we also boost our own supplies from overseas partners and countries where more PPE is coming into the country, but also ensuring that the distribution, which is unprecedented right now in terms of healthcare settings, whether it's hospitals, GP surgeries, care homes, everyone needs that PPE on the front line, and everyone is working to achieve just that, whether it's through the Department of Health, through the Cabinet Office, through Public Health England, through health and safety, through the guidance and the resources that we're trying to get out there. You are apologising for the lack of PPE, which has led to mass infections and deaths of several nurses and doctors. I have been very clear in what I have just said. And, you know, I'm sorry that people feel that way. 
But I do want to say at the same time that we are doing everything within our power and our means to ensure that we can boost our capacity when it comes to PPE and to make sure that we can get capacity PPE out to the front line in the NHS. Thank you. Can I go on to our next question now to Ed Malnick from the Sunday Telegraph? Thank you. Um, Home Secretary, given the rising levels of unemployment under research today suggesting that three million people are going hungry as a result of the pandemic, to what extent are you concerned about the wider negative impact um, of, the, the, the of a prolonged lockdown? And uh, Mr Hewitt, there have been suggestions of a possible ban on outdoor exercise if the current uh, rules aren't followed properly. Would that be enforceable? So, Ed, first of all, um, in response to your question, um, of course, across the whole of government, you know, we are absolutely conscious of the level of vulnerability in society. And you've already heard me speak this afternoon about, you know, categories of individuals who need support from government. But you have spoken about the economic impacts and the economic long-term, socio and economic consequences and impacts of this virus and the impact this virus is having on society, the fact that we are putting forward and we have very, very restrictive measures, stopping people from going into work, but also a huge impact in terms of where we're seeing staff being furloughed across various businesses and things of that nature. I think first and foremost, it's important for everybody to recognise that there is government support and there is financial help and support for individuals and people that need that help. Um, there's the measures obviously through DWP, but also for businesses as well, through the Department mm -hmm. of Business and through the Treasury. Now, when it comes to the long-term situation, None of us can stand here today, it'd be wrong for us to do this, to stand here and speculate in terms of when restrictions might move, when they would be lifted, because this government, and rightly so, is following the scientific advice through SAGE, which meets twice a week, to look at the type of measures and the approaches that we're taking as a government. But I think Ed, the most important point for me to make right now is if people need help and support from government, financial assistance, um, support for their families when it comes to catering for basic bills and food, then absolutely, whether it's through MHCLG, through not just the shielding work, but local government work, getting food out to communities and distribution, but also through the financial support the government has put in place, that help is there. And I would urge anybody that needs that help and support to get in contact. Martin. Ed, the, the measures that were put in place were put in place clearly to save lives and to stop transmission of the disease. It's very clear within those measures that exercise is permissible and the reality is, as I've said, the vast, vast majority of people are adhering to those measures and doing what they can do to, to protect people. We are not calling for any extension of um, the regulations. What I do call for people to do is to act reasonably. Everybody is entitled to take exercise, but it's making sure that you are taking the exercise that's necessary and in the way that is with what we're trying to achieve through these regulations, which is not in a situation where you are risk transmitting the disease to anybody else. So everybody acts responsibly. The vast majority of the public are acting responsibly. And as I've said, if they do encounter police officers when they're out exercising, we will engage with them. We will explain the, the regulations. And if it's appropriate for them to go home, we will encourage them to go home. But it's all about talking and working and using common sense and everybody being responsible. I think, Ed, it's just worth um, amplifying Martin's point that the reason why we put the regulations and the measures in place in the first instance was clearly to stop the spread of the disease. And policing in particular, they've embraced that. When I look at the work, and today I was speaking on a call to all police chiefs with Martin, um, we have regular daily operational calls. We can absolutely see the majority of police officers around the country are following the guidance really well. Um, it is quite clear that, you know, we've seen one or two incidences and we shouldn't allow, you know, a few social media posts to blow out of proportion um, the way in which the guidance and the guidance are being um, 
put in place and in force. At the end of the day, in our country, we have policing by consent, and that means our officers are engaging the public, they're explaining to the public why they shouldn't be having mass gatherings and congregating, while also encouraging them to act responsibly and do the right thing. And I think that is absolutely at the heart of the policing measures that we've been putting in place, and of course the relationship that we have in our own communities with our own police officers. Was there anything else you would like to come back on? Thank you. Well, just um, Home Secretary, on the point about the, the negative impact of the lockdown, were any of those, for example, the, the unemployment and levels of hunger um, and, and the domestic abuse that have yeah. been seen in Paris, have any of those been worse than you expected? Sorry, Ed, you just broke up there um, marginally. I think I, I caught your question. I think you, you just highlighted and said, were those measures worse than we had expected? Is that correct? Were the negative impact, like the levels of unemployment and yeah. so on, worse than you expected? Well, I think, quite frankly, um, the measures that were brought in a few weeks ago now inevitably were going to have an economic consequence. And we are obviously going to work through that. And I think that's been highlighted very clearly, actually, by the work of the Chancellor and the Business Secretary in terms of the direct impact to the economy and the type of measures they have been able to institute to protect people and their livelihoods, which I think is really important. I do think, though, we have to recognise at the same time there's a whole spectrum of social and economic impacts that will materialise over a period of time. We're in the process, and I don't know if Professor Powers would like to um, comment on this at all, but certainly working through SAGE, um, who will be collating this information and the data, and of course they will be able to help inform us on policy decisions that we as a government and as politicians will be able to undertake going forward. But of course our overriding concern will be the health and well-being um, of the pu public and the population, where there is deprivation and where there are serious issues of vulnerability those people are our priority. We have to find ways in which we can still access them, contact them, and look after them, whether that's at a local level or through some of the national schemes that we are putting in place. But, of course, all of this going forward will rightly be based upon the evidence that comes from SAGE and the scientific advice that we'll be getting. Stephen. So, so I think it's important to be honest, and I think we have been. The, the, there is no easy path, there is no easy course through a global <coughs> pandemic. Uh, there are dangers whichever course you take, and, and some of those relate to economic consequences. I think the chief medical officer has been very clear that from a health perspective, uh, there are at least four things that we worry about in terms of the health of, of individuals um, within, within the UK. So, so the first is the direct consequences of uh, deaths and harm through, through COVID-19. The second is that the health service gets overwhelmed by the number of patients, by the surge on it, and I'm pleased to say, as I said earlier, that that has not happened, but clearly that is something that we worry about. The third is, is a reduction in uh, access to health services uh, because we've had to uh, use a lot of our capacity for COVID-19. Uh, and I, I talked earlier about the need for people who have other health conditions, particularly emergency health conditions, to access uh, the health service and, and the fourth is the long-term health uh, effects uh, of the economic uh, uh, consequences of lockdowns and, and some of those uh, are in opposite directions so so it's very hard to to ensure that all of those uh, are mitigated uh, completely uh, so as I said at the start uh, um, it's there's, there's no easy path through a pandemic uh, but the government has said all along that it will it will course that it plot that course based on the best possible scientific evidence. It's SAGE's job to provide that evidence to the government. Uh, and of course, as we learn more about the virus, uh, that evidence uh, becomes clearer all the time. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Ed. Um, can I now go to Nigel Nelson from the Sunday Mirror? Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, yes, this is a, a question for Stephen Powers. Uh, in, in a sense, as a continuation of your last one, is the reason you won't discuss an exit strategy because there can't be one until there's a vaccine, which is possibly 18 months away? Will some restrictions have to stay, pl stay in place till then? And if so, what would those restrictions look like? And a question for the Home Secretary, this is, your, this is your first time at one of these. Where have you been for the last three weeks? And now you're back. Did you speak to the Prime Minister today? 
Thank you. I'll start with Stephen and then I'll come back to you, Nigel. So, so on uh, a vaccine, a vaccine is uh, clearly an important part of any uh, long-term management uh, of, of this virus. Uh, so vaccine development is underway. This is a, a global health emergency. It's probably the greatest global health emergency we've had in a century. And I think what you're seeing uh, is, is, is the greatest scientific response to that that, that we have probably known. So, so the virus was identified very early on uh, in the epidemic in China. It was sequenced, its genetic code was, was made available very quickly and that's allowed academics and companies around the world to very quickly start to develop vaccines. Uh, and you, you will be aware of uh, the various uh, groups that, are, that have been starting to make progress and very early uh, trials in patients. And, and I'm really pleased to say that, that some of that groundbreaking work is being undertaken uh, in the UK, the University of Oxford, you will have heard about. And, and of course, one of the great strengths of the UK is its life sciences, academic base and, and industry. So we will be at the forefront of that vaccine development. Va vaccines take months uh, to develop. We need to make sure that they are safe and effective. Uh, and then, of course, they need to be manufactured and deployed. So, so vaccines are not the only component of an exit strategy. So I wouldn't discount drug treatment. Uh, so uh, drugs uh, and medications uh, we are learning about all the time. Uh, they are also important components of the management of infectious diseases, such as this virus. Uh, and again, uh, there are clinical trials going on around the world, including here in the UK, where thousands of patients are already being entered into uh, clinical trials, uh, so that we can very quickly determine uh, what drugs are likely to work. And, and it, it may be likely that, that drug treatment might come before a vaccine treatment, and, and that's why it's important to learn as much as we can uh, through clinical trials uh, of drug treatments. Um, then, then there are other components of uh, managing this virus, uh, some of which are, uh, well, a, a main part of which, of course, is the, the social distancing uh, uh, approach that we have at the moment. All of those, SAGE and others, will need to give advice to government as the science emerges as, as to how they interact and what the best course ahead is. But I, I, I don't think we can emphasize enough that, that we're still in round one here. We're, we're still fighting the virus very early on. And what's absolutely critical at the moment uh, is that we follow the instructions that have been given, we maintain social distancing, because any strategy will require us to get on top of this virus. And it's only by everybody following the instructions, by staying at home over Easter and in the days to come, uh, that we will have confidence uh, that we have got an underpinning uh, to go forward in terms of any strategy. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Nigel, so I'm delighted to be here today with Martin, and Martin and I have been speaking to each other, I think it's fair to say, every single day for the last four weeks. Um, you've asked where I've been. Well, I've actually been in the Home Office working virtually every single day, seven days a week, three days a week in the Home Office, actually, on a range of areas, policy areas in particular, that are all related to this national pandemic, this um, coronavirus pandemic. And it will come as no surprise to you and to others watching this. When we think about the daily cabinet committees, the meetings that are taking place, when it comes to whether it's the NHS, the economy, public services, policing, when it comes to the policies of the Home Office in particular, the support we're giving to the NHS, whether it's through the visa changes that I've brought in over the last three weeks, or whether it's the work of the border force where we're absolutely prioritizing medical equipment, these are the changes that I have been working on. So I think at this important time, I'm sure viewers at home will want to know that all of their government ministers are working night and day to help to defeat this virus, to importantly keep the public safe. You've heard the message that we want people to stay at home, follow the rules, follow the guidance that we have been undertaking and been pursuing. But importantly, making sure that this government is working at every single level across every government department, because this is not just about the work of one government department anymore, that we work together, we support together to absolutely get us through this national pandemic. Was there anything else you wanted to come back on, Nigel? Yes, yeah, so just back, back to, to Stephen, uh, to Stephen Powers' point. Um, the, the question was, whether it's drugs or a vaccine, will we have to carry on with some form of restrictions until one or the other is actually found? Or is ending lockdown going to be a political and economic decision rather than a science and health one? 
Well, well, I think I, I'm going to leave the political uh, mm. question aside, but I think what the job of scientists and doctors and other uh, clinicians is, is to provide the government with the best possible uh, scientific uh, advice as to the strategies to manage this virus uh, over the months to come, and, and probably uh, over longer than months, because it's highly likely that over time this virus will become established worldwide in, in population. So, so this is not... Um, this was never going to be a sprint uh, over a few weeks. This is, this is going to be uh, a longer race. It's going to be uh, a marathon. And, and we do, as all countries need to do, is to develop our strategy and plot our course through that. Uh, I've given you some of the examples of the, the sorts of things that we need to consider. And, and as I've emphasized, it's only a couple of months since this virus emerged. We are learning more and more about the science all the time. Uh, and therefore, uh, as that new knowledge becomes available, uh, we will need to evolve and modify our course to manage it over time. That, that, if you look back in history, is how other infectious diseases that have come into the human population have been managed, and it will be no, no different uh, this time. Uh, and, and in terms of the economic consequences, I think in the previous answer, uh, I gave some sense of how we think in terms of health of trying to counterbalance uh, the effects of economic consequences on health. But there is no easy course through this. There is no uh, magical solution that, that, that doesn't require difficult decisions uh, and difficult uh, choices to be made. But fundamentally, as the government has said, we need to base all these decisions on what the science is telling us. Yeah, and Nigel, I'd just conclude by reaffirming really what I said previously to Ed Melnick, that this government is absolutely committed to following the advice that is being provided, the scientific advice. We are in a new, we're in new territory right now. Um, I see the scientific reports every single day from various government scientific advisors, as do all my colleagues. And I think importantly, we've been very clear in terms of the direction of travel, how we're basing our decisions. They're based upon the evidence, they're based upon the facts, and of course we're learning every single day. We will have to make decisions in due course, but right now, the message to the country absolutely is to follow the advice that comes from government. That advice is based on the scientific and medical advice, and that is effectively what I would urge everyone to do. Thank you. Can I now go on to move on to Harry Cole from the Mail on Sunday? Good afternoon. Thank you, Home Secretary. Um, your already delayed immigration bill needs a rapid passage through Parliament in order to get the borders ready for the end of the transition period, supposedly at the end of this year. What is the government's plan to allow legislation and voting in Parliament to continue while this lockdown drags on? And would you personally back the ideas put around of a virtual Parliament and remote voting um, in order to get your bill through? And if I may, um, it was reported this morning that the Prime Minister uh, faces a lengthy spell at Chequers um, as he gets better. What's the message from the Cabinet and from you um, on when, he's, when he should return to work? Well, Harry, let me start with your last question first. The message to the Prime Minister is that we want him to get better and he needs a time and space to rest, recuperate and recover. That is absolutely vital and the whole of Cabinet um, would support that message. It's vital that our Prime Minister gets well and I think it's, that is the priority and the focus right now. You've mentioned um, the immigration bill, which was due to come to Parliament second reading on the 21st of April. Um, I think it's fair to say at this stage, obviously we are fully adhering to the science, the guidance, the guidelines that we're all putting in place right now um, when it comes to going to work, etc. We do not know yet, and there are many discussions, and I can't really elaborate any further on those discussions, about how Parliament will resume and function. I think at this particular time, um, we have to focus the resources of government, all our energies, ministerial responses, cabinet responses, every single sinew of government focusing on saving lives and dealing with this awful disease, this virus, um, coronavirus. But I do think at some stage, you know, we will inevitably have to think about um, the work of Parliament, scrutiny, um, and also legislation. But I think right now we are focused on absolutely making sure we save lives. Would you like to come back at all? Yeah, I wonder if Professor Powers had any advice for um, anyone, not just the PM, but anyone who suffered badly from this uh, virus and when they should return to work. Well, of course, I too am delighted that the Prime Minister is now recovering. Uh, I'm not his physician. He, the team of doctors and uh, clinicians, nurses at uh, St Thomas's who are absolutely world-class 
uh, will be looking after him. And, and I'm confident that they will do what all clinicians do for every patient they look after, whether it's a, a, another recovering patient from coronavirus or any other patient. They will give the appropriate advice in terms of recovery based on the clinical course of uh, the, the condition that the individual patient has gone through uh, and the personal circumstances of that individual. That's what doctors uh, and uh, other clinicians do day in, day out, and I'm absolutely confident that they will give the Prime Minister the correct and the appropriate advice. Thanks, Harry. I'm going to now move on to Simon Binns from Lad Bible. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this question is for the Home Secretary uh, and Mr Hewitt as well. Um, we called seven major police forces across the UK this week to, to ask for and understand figures around dispersals, arrests and fines um, last weekend in order to get an understanding of whether people were listening to government guidance. Um, only one, Greater Manchester, shared the fact that they've been involved in um, over 1,100 coronavirus-related breaches. Mm -hmm. That was between the 25th of March and 7th of April. Um, it's appreciated that you've, you've shared the number of fines handed out today. Does the government or the NPCC know the national figure for breaches, for arrests, and for the average size of fine? Can you share those now? Uh, and also, would there be a further, stronger support for the police to help them tackle this continuing problem if the numbers go up rather than down in in the first two weeks of reporting and collating that data you mentioned previously? Sure, Simon. So let me begin before I um, hand over to Martin. And I'll ask Martin actually to talk about the data, because in his opening remarks, he did speak about the data collection that we are now doing. I think, first of all, I am absolutely clear and unequivocal in support for the police. And that means in terms of giving them the resources that they need through this really challenging time. I've spoken previously, not just today, about absolutely not just backing them, but making sure that through the guidance that we're putting forward, they are empowered in the right way to engage, explain and encourage you know, the people, members of the public that they come across, and let's not forget, we have policing by consent. Our police officers are members of the communities within which they operate, within which they police. So we are supporting them. And there's a lot of work that we're doing in terms of, yes, not just empowering them, and it's not about new regulations or new guidance. The powers are there. But absolutely restating and reiterating the message to the public which is that if we're serious and we are absolutely committed to and serious about saving lives, then we need the public to stay at home. Um, the breaches or the number of breaches that you mentioned for Greater Manchester, I think they're absolutely consistent with the feedback that Martin and I have had through our calls as well. We've seen certain practices, garden parties and house parties, and I think Greater Manchester Police would be the first to say that, you know, they're out there breaking them up. That is completely going against the grain and the spirit of, ha of having these measures, these guidelines. And obviously, we're asking people to take individual personal responsibility because even being out there in the public domain, they could absolutely help to spread the disease and put other lives at risk, and that's what we don't want. But Martin, do you want to just speak about the data? Yes, thank you, Simon. I mean, I think the first thing to say, and there's a really important point, even with that number, if you think of a very densely populated area like Greater Manchester, I really want to start by saying the vast majority of the public are abiding by the rules and they are acting responsibly, and that's a really important point to make. But if we think about why these regulations were put in, the purpose of these regulations was to reduce the transmission of this virus and to save people's lives. So whilst we might describe them as breaches, the police will respond to those calls when people will people let us know about that. And our objective is to get people back to where they should be and to avoid the transmission. So it's really important that we're responding and we are responding across the country when we are finding out about those. But the really important point is we're engaging, we're explaining and we're getting people to return home. And only in those extreme cases will we have to resort to the enforcement, which would be by a fine, or if there was some other activity there, potentially an arrest. Now, clearly, we, we obviously know how many arrests that we are making, as we always do. The fine system is a very, very new system. We have now got it centrally um, coordinated. And as I said in my uh, opening remarks, next week, I think Wednesday, we will be producing data on exactly how many fines that we have 
um, we have, have given out as part of this process and other data in terms of how we are policing the, um, the lockdown period. And as I said again in my remarks, we will be sharing that every two weeks. But the really, really important point is that anybody can transmit this virus. Everybody needs to be responsible. And we will engage with people to, to help them to be responsible and to understand what is required. So this is not about how many fines or how many arrests. This is about getting the majority of people, which they already are, abiding by the rules so that we're able to protect the NHS and save lives. Thank you, Martin. Simon, was there anything else you'd like to come back on at all? Yeah, just, I mean, it sounds like we're waiting until next week to get those figures. Mm. I, I, I suspect, you know, if, if the data does show um, an increase in breaches over that two-week period, would that lead to stronger powers? And, and what would those look like? Are you having those conversations? What more could you do beyond what exists currently to, to get the message home and to make sure that people aren't flouting the guidance that's there already? Well, I, I think, first of all, I come back very much to the theme of the questions and the answers we've given um, so far this afternoon. You know, the purpose of the guidance that we put down and the regulations that went through Parliament um, over three weeks ago, as Martin has said, was absolutely to stop the transmission of this virus. We don't want people out there um, behaving in an irresponsible way and, you know, effectively helping to spread the virus. We will obviously, and this isn't just about breaches, but we will make our decisions as we previously made our decisions around the regulations and the guidance that were sent out to police forces around the country. Based on, on the trends, the scientific evidence that also comes forward over the next week or so, and naturally we have to look at all of this in the totality in the round, and then we will absolutely, as with all aspects of government right now, you know, keep under review, look at what is going on. But actually, I come back to the main point that we have seen so far. The majority of the British public, and I thank them for the way in which they are following the guidance, the guidelines that the government has specified and put out, um, and to say for the police officers themselves, they have been working incredibly um, well and hard across communities to engage, explain and encourage people not to go out there in the public domain unnecessarily. And we will continue to do that. We will absolutely work with our policing colleagues, police forces around the country to continue to do that. So, Can I yes, of course. Martin. Just really to make the point, Simon, of course, we will start producing those numbers. And on the basis that three and a bit yeah. weeks ago we started at zero, those numbers will increase in terms of where we are having to use enforcement. But I do just want to reiterate the point, and the Home Secretary has alluded, this morning I chaired a conference call where we had the Chief Constables from every force in the United Kingdom, and we heard of, uh, from Scotland, from Northern Ireland, from Wales, and from English chiefs, and everybody was saying that we are getting to a very, very significant scale. We are getting compliance from people. And in different parts of the country, as you would imagine, the challenge is slightly different. But every force is working towards that, working towards those first three E's of engaging, explaining, and encouraging before we get to enforcing. But again, and we are laboring the point because it is the important point, the regulations are here to reduce the transmission of the disease. It's not about criminalizing people or the police interacting, it's about reducing that transmission. And I'm really, I think it's really positive that what I was getting back this morning from the, the majority, from all of the chiefs, they didn't all speak obviously, but from all of the chiefs that spoke was a really positive message about the way they were working with their communities, with other authorities, local authorities, people who run beauty spots, people who run parks, tourist groups, all of those working together to achieve the ultimate aim, which is reduce the transmission by keeping people distanced. Thank you, Martin. Simon, thanks for your question. Um, I'm going to bring today's proceedings to a close, but first of all, I'd like to thank Martin and Stephen for not just their hard work, but also for their contributions today. Um, just to conclude, I know that this is an anxious time for everybody at home, and our message is absolutely clear and simple. When it comes to the theme that I have spoken about today, which is the risk of hidden abuse within the home, domestic abuse, the message is simple. You are not alone and you are not on your own. And our message to the abusers and to the perpetrators of these crimes is equally as clear. You will not get, get away with the crimes that you are committing. And that's because of our brilliant police and law enforcement agencies who are there to respond 
but also to everybody within the voluntary sector and the charities, and in particular to the domestic abuse partners and colleagues that I've been working with. Our new campaign will absolutely highlight the support available to victims of domestic abuse and that advice that staying at home, obviously if you're at risk, does not apply and that there is a safe place for you to go to. That also applies to the funding that the government is putting in through the helplines and the support for victims within their own homes. And just to restate as well, that throughout all of this, the work, and my, thank goes, well, my thanks goes to our exceptional police, who are doing such a remarkable job right now at this difficult time to protect the most vulnerable, but also to keep us safe and to keep our NHS safe as well. And again, I urge the entire nation to keep up what is just an extraordinary national effort over the bank holiday weekend by staying at home to protect the NHS and to save lives. Thank you.